one of the ways we can look at that, it, it, like predicting HABs or really understanding all the factors that contribute to HABs can be quite challenging because of, the, because of all the mechanisms that can influence their, um, their growth, um, as well as, as a number of stochastic, uh, stochastic factors. Um, but I think if we break the questions up into different parts, we can understand some of the most important ones. So for example, I don't think we have enough information to be able to draw out what caused the initial HAB increase in the Alameda Oakland channel. There just wasn't enough observational data around that time. Um, we can maybe catch it the next time around, but not this past one. Or why was it heterosigma as opposed to any of the other dozens of organisms that we see? But some of the questions that I think we can start getting a handle on is what allowed the bloom to initially spread to and flourish within South Bay? What caused the severity, the magnitude, the duration, and what allowed it to spread gradually and then uh, what gangbusters throughout South Bay and then the, the abrupt bloom termination? Um, there's a lot of different processes we can think through. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk through all these. I'm just going to put up a, a very, all, the, all the things that we know that can influence an event like this or can influence a bloom. Um, light levels, stratification from excess, from additional heat coming into the water column, mixing of the water column by winds and tides, sediment being resuspended and blocking light out from, due, to, due to mixing. Um, and then also considering all those things, this, this organism heterosigma akashiwo is a flagellate. It has a tail, it's an adaptive measure that allows it to swim up to gather light and swim down to gather nutrients. How important is that swimming speed and how does it allow it to fight against the tide successfully? And how was that important? Was that an important component of its success? Um, transport, nitrogen concentrations, um, and lastly, um, not lastly, grazers and viruses, some of the top-down pressures that seem to not have been there at the beginning of this event and allowed this thing to go run away crazy until maybe something finally caught up with it and wrestled it under control. Um, and then lastly, climate change, other factors like that. Um, one of the things, I think the, the first thought that we had when we were approaching this, trying to understand the cause of the event, was what changed? What was different about this year? Was there something so fundamentally different, a really stark observation? Um, and that's one way of looking at this. Like, let's say there's one factor. It could have been more, more sunlight or much lower suspended sediments or weaker winds. Um, but that, that's, that's one way of looking at it here. I'm trying to show the blue lines are like the long-term seasonal values and the gray, or sorry, the gray are the long-term seasonal ranges. The blue may be the range in, during this particular year. And then factor C, in this case, well, let's just say, for example, it was quite low. Maybe that would be a causal factor. Um, another way of looking at this is to think about it more like windows of opportunity. So that there's something happening in the system that always makes it a little bit more vulnerable to harmful algae to grow like this. But then on top of that, there could be other other processes, the same sort of factors, but you need both the window of opportunity that makes things more, uh, makes, makes it, it more reasonable for growth or easy for growth, and then you need some deviation, maybe a smaller deviation in one of these factors. Um, we've been exploring this along two paths. One of them was by like, looking at strongly differing forcings in summer 2022, and this is all early indication work, and I would say that one of the ways we thought about this was like any real smoking guns. Um, and the real big smoking guns, they didn't really jump out at us. There were a few things, maybe a bit more sunlight, less clouds, um, potentially lower turbidity, um, but not things like warmer temperatures or stratification. That, didn't, that hasn't jumped out at us from the observational data. Um, the one that we did want to focus on, though, is the swimming speed, the sw swimming of, of, of these organisms. One of the key reasons is because heterosigma is a relatively strong swimmer, but not just that, there's also about 15 harmful organisms that we're tracking regularly. And of those, harm, of those 15, 14, 12 of them are flagellates. And so this isn't just a wild goose chase to understand one organism. It's potentially looking into a behavioral attribute that, that could allow certain organisms to be competitive in this window of opportunity. Um, okay, thanks. So one of the things, I'll just show you one quick animation here. Um, we, we did a model simulation. The, this is a cross section on the left hand side going from near the Dumbarton Bridge to the, to the Bay Bridge and on the right hand side showing the direction of that. And what we did is we added, we allowed the phytoplankton or we allowed a tracer to actually have a swimming velocity, 10 meters per day up, 10 meters per day down to see whether it's able to fight against the tides. And the bottom is showing the tidal variability, the tidal range variability as well as the timing of the day or daylight hours. And the brighter colors here again are higher concentrations of the, tr of the tracer, the, the organism swimming up to the surface, 
you can see the, th these narrow, thin layers closer to the surface. This is one of the things that we think is quite important to understand, um, and this balance between not just the, sorry, is that, did that switch? Not just the, um, not just the, the strength or the weakness of the tides, because, but actually also the timing of those weak tides or the timing of the, neap, of the weak parts of the neap tide. And it turns out that during this event and during other events, including the, the reemergence of the HAB event this year, it, it was during, again, during neap tides and as well the, during the daylight hours was when, um, was when the weakest of the daily tides occurred, potentially allowing the organism to swim more aggressively towards the surface and experience more success gathering light. Um, I'm going to stop there, go to the end. The so PABs in San Francisco Bay, Bay hosts a numerous, numerous taxa. Prior to, prior to 2022, no, no or few severe events. This is an extremely high abundance event, low oxygen, fish mortality. Um, nutrients were not necessarily the cause or the spark for the event, but, other, but they were the fuel that allowed it to spread as far as, as, it, as it went. Um, work that's happening now or ongoing work, expanded intensified monitoring, including an early warning system. Uh, one of the things we've been working extensively on is um, a a locally tuned San Francisco Bay tuned algorithm for chlorophyll for early warning. This is showing the same August 2022 data though using this updated algorithm. Um, also expanded intensified monitoring where we, we recently uh, received a $3 million grant from NOAA for HAB monitoring program expansion in collaboration with SFEI, USGS, DWR, a number of other collaborators throughout the region. Um, continuing to investigate the important mechanisms as well as working closely with the water board and stakeholders to explore management scenarios that will prevent or mitigate future events. And I'll close with collaborators. Thank you. Let me know if you can't hear me. Okay. So as uh, Ian mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the development of an assessment framework for dissolved oxygen in the Lower South Bay. So um, this is a map of the Lower South Bay. Um, it's a shallow, small volume. Closer to? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so it's a shallow, small volume subendayment that exchanges slowly with the rest of the bay. Uh, there are three publicly owned treatment works that uh, release treated wastewater into the system, and there are also connections to restored salt ponds that have complex interactions with the nutrient dynamics in the system as well. So these conditions have led to um, these conditions have led to higher nutrient concentrations in phytoplankton biomass than other subendayments in the bay, and frequent low dissolved oxygen levels in some parts of the system. So to better understand these complex dynamics, the nutrient management strategy is monitoring water quality at several locations in the lower South Bay. <laughs> Pictured here are our uh, SON locations, which are high frequency sensors that continuously, continuously measure a suite of water quality parameters at 15 minute intervals. So we measure things like dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, um, and we have stations both in the shallow sloughs and also in the deep channel. And the colors of each station correspond to when the station was deployed. So the ones that are in red are, um, were deployed in 2015. That's when many of them were established. But there are some stations that were deployed as early as 2013. So these are plots of dissolved oxygen data generated from the SANS over the last seven years. And the colors here correspond to dissolved oxygen concentrations, or DO. And um, the higher concentrations are the kind of blue, uh, well, there's not much blue here, but green, green colors. And then lower dissolved oxygen concentrations are yellow, uh, yellow reds and um, oranges. 
and the names of the stations are on the on the right hand side but the important takeaway here is that i'm showing you the um, two channel stations at san mateo and dumbarton bridge and the data shows that oxygen concentrations tend to remain high in the channel but when we look at the slew data we see that low do is common especially at alviso and guadalupe sloughs which are the second and the third from the bottom you see there's a lot more red and um, orange and yellow in, in the those plots so there are DO objectives for San Francisco Bay, which set a limit of five milligrams per liter for most of the bay. Um, and then there's also site-specific objectives that have been developed for sloughs in Sassoon Marsh. But there are no objectives specific to the lower South Bay sloughs, even though they are very distinct habitats from the, the bay with different conditions. But if we, if we apply this five milligram per liter threshold, which is a, is a common cutoff for um, dissolved oxygen, if we apply it to the Dumbarton Station in the channel, we can see that there are almost no observations that fall below this threshold in any season. So this figure is showing percent observations below five milligrams per liter. But when we look at the SLU stations, it's no surprise after seeing the time series, but we see the observations below five milligrams per liter are very common, especially in the summertime, which are the orange bars. And um, the low DO events occur most frequently in Guadalupe SLU, which um, about 80% or more than 80% of the time um, in the summer, uh, observations are below five milligrams per liter. But the other slew stations are actually having really frequent events below this threshold as well. So um, anywhere from 25 to 60% of the time in the summer. So it looks like there could be a problem in the lower South Bay if we compare to these basin plan objectives. But the lower South Bay slews are dynamic habitats. And um, the biota may need different levels of dissolved oxygen than the open bay. So um, what we really want to know after seeing this is what um, are these oxygen levels problematic for fish and other biota in lower South Bay sloughs, and what would constitute protective DO levels. So answering these questions is the main um, is the main goal of the assessment framework in lower South Bay sloughs and creeks, which is the project I'm talking about today, and um, the work I'm presenting is from the last two years. But work has been ongoing for this project for more than five years. And um, the aim is to complete this work and have a final report next summer. And so the, the main goals of this project are to develop thresholds, um, tools, or models that limit oxygen concentrations that are protective of aquatic organisms in the lower South Bay sloughs and tidal creeks, and also to assess protective DO thresholds under future conditions. And we convened a group of experts to advise us on the scientific approach, and then also a committee of stakeholders to provide input on the goals and the eventual application of the of the work and um, this event this information will eventually be handed off to the water board so they can decide how to use the science in a regulatory context so there are three different ways to answer this question we're pursuing these three different types of analyses with the goal of using them as multiple lines of evidence so we have the best possible science backing up any regulatory recommendation and the virginia province approach um, at the top is the toxicological approach the metabolic index is a mechanistic analysis, and then the fish community models is an empirical approach. And I'll walk you through each in this talk. And all three of them rely on having data for fish and other biota that are present in the system. And luckily in the Lower South Bay, there are over 10 years of observational data of fish abundance collected by a team at UC Davis, uh, currently led by Levi Lewis. And this team has been conducting otter, monthly, monthly otter trawls for uh, more, so, well, since 2010 in the Lower South Bay at the uh, sites um, that are indicated on the map here with black dots. Um, and they also measure associated water quality parameters, including salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen temperature, which has been really useful for this analysis. And um, this has been really key for understanding the dissolved oxygen needs of the fish community. And you'll be hearing about this data set throughout my presentation. So the first approach is the Virginia province approach. Uh, it's a well-established regulatory tool originally developed by the EPA for the East Coast, but it has been adapted to other systems and is similar to how the EPA derives criteria for toxic chemicals. Essentially, the species in the system um, are identified, um, then existing data about their tolerance to low DO are pulled from lab studies and literature, and then if, daddy, if data are not available, um, surrogate species are used. And the species are ranked based on their sensitivity to low DO, and the most sensitive, sensitive species are used to determine both chronic and acute objectives. And this approach is fast to do because it's based on existing data and relatively low cost because it's straightforward and 
widely accepted, but there are limitations. So the main one is that the data, if data are not available, um, then um, often the, the numbers are based on surrogate species from different systems who, whose tolerance to low DO can actually be quite different. So that's really the main, the main limitation of that approach. And we collaborated with Tetra Tech to carry out this analysis. So this work was led um, by Sudra Yoroi, um, Jerry Diamond, and Alexis Walls at, at Tetra Tech. And um, there's still decisions to be made about which guidance to use. And there are a couple options for the acute thresholds, which I'm showing here. This depends on whether or not sturgeon are included in the calculation, but you can see the numbers are very similar. Um, the duration of the acute uh, threshold is, uh, or the averaging period of the acute threshold is typically 24 hours. So what this means is that um, the data, all the water quality data collected over 24 hours is averaged, um, which removes dips in oxygen that occur on hourly or tidal scales. And then similarly, the chronic threshold has a range depending on whether or not uh, both salmon and sturgeon are included. So these numbers are higher, um, but the averaging period for this threshold can range from one week to up to one month. And when we compare the conditions in the system to these, th these thresholds, we can see that exceedances are relatively common, especially for the chronic threshold um, at the slew station. So this figure is showing um, the thresholds, they were developed actually in percent dissolved ox percent saturation. Um, so that's the panel on the top and then milligrams per liter on the bottom. And the more protective chronic um, numbers are the uh, green and then the pink is the, are the less protective chronic numbers that don't include salmon and sturgeon, or I should, I should just say it's like a, it's a lower number because it doesn't include them. And then um, the acute uh, thresholds are in blue. And um, you can see at many stations, they're uh, common, like the conditions are commonly going below um, these thresholds um, as, at many of the slew stations, including at Alviso, Guadalupe, um, Coyote Creek, and Maori. So the VPA is a good base for setting DO objectives, but other analyses could support this approach to ensure that the numbers are protective enough for the species in the system. So another approach we're pursuing is looking at multiple stressors through the, through the development of a metabolic index. Um, this accounts for the temperature dependence of metabolic demand. Um, and the theory behind it is that as temperature increases, not only does the solubility of dissolved oxygen decrease, but the metabolic requirements of biota increase as well which basically means that as temperatures get hotter, uh, fish or other biota need more oxygen to carry out the same function. And so this puts a squeeze on fish in a warming climate or in increasing temperatures. And so the metabolic index incorporates this link when determining suitable habitat, and it can be based either on experimental or field data, which um, is then used to determine the temperature dependence of a species metabolic demand. And then these characteristics are used to calculate the DO required to support metabolic activity at in-situ temperatures, and uh, sorry, in-situ environmental conditions. And so this analysis helps identify DO requirements needed um, to support the fish that are present in the system. Um, and this work has been led by Evan Howard, who just finished his postdoc at Princeton and has now um, started a position at NOAA. And I, I only have two really technical figures, so just bear with me on these. Um, this is a plot of some of the analysis that's been done to date. Uh, this shows the proportion of the water quality time series with a given combination of dissolved oxygen, which is on the y-axis and temperature. And then the color bar, bar shows the proportion of total observation. So every square in this figure shows um, when, uh, like if there is a given time point in the more sensor data time series at that given oxygen and temperature, and then the darker the blue color means the more common those conditions, um, the mo more common those conditions were in the data set. And then the lines across the plot are based on the fish metabolic data collected from a range of systems. So this is not data specific to San Francisco Bay um, or estuaries, but it's to get a preliminary sense of how we're doing in the system. Um, this solid black line, the three solid black lines at the bottom show the thresholds below which lethal effects are expected for some proportion of species if uh, conditions um, persist. And the reason that these lines are slanted, both of the both the dotted lines and these darker lines is because the DO, again, the DO requirements of, um, of biota go up with temperature. So from the top to bottom, these correspond to the threshold at or above which 25% of known species are limited, 50% and 75%. So as conditions worsen, a higher proportion of species um, are affected. 
The dashed black line shows the proportion of species that are expected to have suppressed ecological activity. So this would be reduced aerobic scope for things like movement and, and reproduction. And as you can see, the conditions where lethal effects are expected are not occurring at the channel site. So this is the Dunbarton station. I, I think you can see my sense. So all of the conditions are um, all the conditions are above where you would expect to see lethal effects, even for the most sensitive species. Um, and then again, if the uh, conditions are um, mostly not occurring where um, these uh, like uh, ecological impacts would be expected as well. But when we look at the sluice site, so this is Alviso and Guadalupe, um, again, conditions may, um, that may be lethal for fish are relatively rare, uh, but conditions that may be causing suppressed ecological activity, I still have my mouse over there. Maybe not. Okay. Um, uh, are the conditions where you would see express, um, sorry, um, a suppressed ecological activity um, is occurring really frequently in the sloughs. So even the least sensitive species are being affected. So like the bottom um, dotted line, which is showing the 25% least sensitive, um, most of the conditions in Guadalupe are actually occurring below that line and like about half of them are occurring at Alviso. So, um, so um, this provides support that both temperature and metabolic requirements are important considerations when setting geo objectives and sloughs. So um, that uh, plot that I just showed you, um, it's from a generalized data set, and, and we want to know about fish in our system. Um, as I mentioned before, the metabolic index can be developed both using um, lab data or biogeographic data about metabolic requirements. So since the lab data for San Francisco Bay is really limited, we needed to see if we could derive traits based on when and where species are present uh, using the UC Davis fish community data. And this is an example plot showing um, striped bass, but the patterns were similar between um, the other species that we plotted as well. And um, here we can see that the habitat preference, well, this, this figure is showing you habitat preference um, and the, is showing the um, preference for specific dissolved oxygen, percent dissolved oxygen and temperature conditions. And um, the darker the blue color, that's indicating that conditions for which um, the fit, fish has a, more of a preference. And the striped bass is a handy species because the lethal and ecological limits for the species are actually have been determined through laboratory studies. So those lines are on there as well, the, the red line being the lethal and then the, um, the black line being the ecological limit. And the analysis found that um, for all the species we looked at, uh, they're disproportionately present in higher oxygen conditions and that they generally have a preference for um, more than 50% dissolved oxygen saturation, which is about four to five milligrams per liter, depending on temperature and salinity. And the plots also showed some patterns in the data um, are consistent with temperature dependence of oxygen threshold. Um, this pattern wasn't as clear. Essentially what this means is that they, um, the fish were more likely to be present at um, low DO conditions, um, or, sorry, present at higher DO conditions when temperatures are higher. Um, and so, um, Though I guess the final point here is that it's just it's interesting to look at the striped bass because the lower South Bay abundance data follows the laboratory data pretty well. But you can see that there is a lot of noise in these patterns. Um, usually for the biogeographic method, we would fit a line based um, on the distribution of the data, um, but there's a lot of noise here. So despite the frequency of sampling or the frequency of sampling for this data set, the fact that it's been going on for more than 10 years, the total observations for any one species is still maybe a little bit too low for a biogeographic inference method. So we can get a sense of the dissolved oxygen preference, but um, if we want to derive specific hypoxia tolerance traits from this, um, so how much do the metabolic needs change with temperature, uh, there would be a lot of uncertainty. Um, and then although this is a limitation of the data, there is a larger global data set of metabolic needs for marine species um, and patterns in hypoxia thresholds with changing temperature actually very consistent across species. So um, there may be a way to apply a temperature correction to the estimated protective DO levels using this relationship. So the, the findings of the metabolic index analysis to date are that DO concentrations occasionally dip below published lethal thresholds. Um, sorry, the font got a little weird here. Uh, in lower South Bay sloughs and often go below ecological thresholds. Fish distribution in lower South Bay um, sloughs are consistent with oxygen sensitivity and they appear to be temperature dependent, but it's difficult to determine um, species specific temperature dependence um, of hypoxia sensitivity from the bi biogeographic data. 
Um, but patterns in temperature dependent hypoxia thresholds are relatively consistent across marine species and, and could be used in the analysis. So I'll just quickly go through the last approach that we're using, but I, I don't have a lot of time to go into detail. Um, we're, this is an empirical analysis of the fish survey data from the Sluzing Creeks. Um, the survey data can be interpreted using GAMs or generalized additive models. Um, they use smoother to describe smoothers to describe relationships between predictor and response variables. And they can be used to develop models describing how fish abundance co-varies with water quality. So here we're looking at salinity, dissolved oxygen, and temperature. And they also allow us to examine the response of fish to these environmental vari uh, variables while also accounting for seasonal, interannual, and spatial effects. And similar to the metabolic index, um, this approach gives us information about the DO requirements of fish in the system, but it isn't an established regulatory approach for setting DO criteria. So I'm going to skip this slide because I was optimistic I could cover it, but <laughs> running out of time. Um, so uh, these are the, the three different approaches I mentioned. And um, yeah, they're all three of them are using the fish abundance data um, that was, has been collected by UC Davis, as well as two of the approaches are based on laboratory data as well. Um, they're inherently connected through this, this overlap of the data that they're using. Um, and together they can provide a diverse set of data about protective DO levels that hopefully can ultimately inform the development of criteria. And so um, the, I guess the takeaway here is that um, the oxygen is often falling below five milligrams per liter in lower South Bay sloughs. And so the goal of this study is to determine what would constitute protective DO levels using multiple lines of evidence. And the um, BPA gave us, or the Virginia Province approach, approach generated draft chronic and acute criteria, and that these other mechanistic and empirical analyses could be powerful for validating and informing the BPA. And um, I'll just show the collaborators and experts. So some of these people actually did a lot of the work, um, and then also the, the a couple people on here are the experts that joined our expert meeting. And I'll leave you with a slide about more information. So thank you. All right, I've been told to speak up into the mic. Tell me if it's too loud. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, cool, I'm gonna talk to you about sediment loads at the climate extremes. I wanna acknowledge my co-author and mentor, Lester McKee. Lester, I know you're watching. Thank you always for your support. So during a three week period this past January, nine atmospheric rivers hammered California. These storms caused over 700 landslides, power outages affecting half a million people, flooding and levee breaches, 20 deaths, and damages estimated at over a billion dollars. Now let's look at the San Francisco's daily rainfall for the last season. If you were here on New Year's Eve, you definitely remember the New Year's Eve event. This was the second wettest uh, day on record for San Francisco, which dated back to 1849. And this three-week period was the second wettest three-week period also in that 174-year record. Um, I looked at the stats on this, and the only year that topped 2023 for that three-week period was 1862. And I thought, wow, 1862 must have been a wet year. Now, looking at the heaviest three-week period uh, on a statewide average cumulative precipitation, we see that January 2023 was not unprecedented, um, but it was in the upper end of what we've seen in the last century. Um, <clears throat> there's quite a bit of consensus that climate change is increasing the odds of similar events, but also much worse ones. So it turns out that California has a long history of megastorms, massive storms lasting several weeks and leading to cataclysmic floods, which have occurred on average every 200 years for the past two millennia. Most recently was the great flood of, anybody know it? 1862. Okay, whereas the eight, uh, average statewide precipitation for all of 2023 was about three feet, just under three feet, the Great Flood of 1862 dumped 10 feet of water on California overall 
over 43 days. It created a bathtub out of the Central Valley. So much economic damage, government employees, including the governor, went unpaid for a year and a half. They had to move the state capitol to San Francisco for months while the waters receded in Sacramento. About 4,000 people perished in these floods, which was 1% of all of California's population. It has been described as the worst disaster ever to strike California. All right, so a century ago, these storms occurred every 200 years on average. A 2022 study found that due to climate change that has already occurred, the, the risk of these types of storms has doubled. And given another one degree C of warming, which is all but certain, the risk of these types of storms will double again to one in every 45 years. So what I'm saying here is that for many of you in the audience today, it is more likely than not that you are going to experience a California megastorm in your lifetime. Short of a megastorm, here are the predictions. Whoops, that's the, that's the great flood of 1862. Sorry about that. That's Sacramento. All right, so <clears throat> I should be looking at my screen. I'm looking at my notes. I'm old school. Okay. So short of a megastorm, here are the predictions. Researchers at Scripps studied 16 global climate models and found that in general, California is expected to get about the same or slightly more precipitation on average. Um, but there will be fewer small storm events in exchange for more condensed uh, potent atmospheric rivers. Also, the wet years are likely to get wetter and more frequent and the dry years will also get more frequent. In a very simplified manner, we might see something like this. A slight increase in total rainfall depicted by the red line, uh, but more importantly, the frequency and the amplitude of the wet and dry years is likely to increase. Now, this is a really simplified drawing, uh, but there is real modeling work that shows similar patterns. So here's what the federal government is showing from their predictions for San Francisco for the rest of the century. Maybe a slight increase in average annual precipitation shown in the red line, but increasing chances of big wet and big dry years. Okay, with all that context, we're gonna shift to sediment. Sediment is a major priority topic for the RMP. We have a whole work group studying sediment led by Scott Desterhoff somewhere in the audience. Um, uh, and it is very intertwined with the health of the bay. My colleague Katie McKnight, also in the sediment work group, says this. Sediment is a lifeblood of San Francisco Bay. It serves three key functions. To create and maintain tidal marshes and mudflats. To transport uh, nutrients and contaminants. And to reduce impacts from excessive human-derived nutrients in the bay. I am not part of the sediment work group, but where my team does come into play is in providing information about the amount of sediment or the sediment loads coming off the watersheds and into the bay. In 2022, we developed a dynamic simulation model. This was work by my co-conspirator Tan Z, who's now with Alameda County. And this, gives, this model gives us information about how much sediment is washing off the landscape into the bay on an hourly time step. It's called the watershed dynamic model. It's something that my mentor Lester McKee has literally been dreaming about for over a decade. It's being used in many RMP studies already because of how, foundation, how foundational sediment is to so much of our RMP work. In a project that we just completed was monitoring sediment loads on four creeks to provide additional input data to that watershed dynamic model to further improve its calibration. So we studied these four creeks and the study spanned four years that were very interesting climatically, both really wet and really dry. The study was funded as a supplemental environmental project, which Tom mentioned in his talk and um, my, my, my co-authors were Kyle Stark, Sarah Pierce, Lester McKee, and David Peterson. Am I doing okay talking into the mic? Yeah. Okay, right on. 
Okay, now uh, for all the sediment loads study work that we did in a single slide. Um, so again, this study was to prov provide more um, input data for our watershed dynamic model. Now, ideally your calibration data for a model spans the greatest range possible for your most important environmental factors, in this case, rain, flow, and sediment. And although only four years, this project got an awesome range. The first two years were extremely dry. The next year was about average, and then 2023 was epically wet, right? So this, uh, these graphs, one for each of the four creeks, shows the sediment load during those four years. You'll notice 2020 and 2021, very low sediment loads. Uh, 2022, around the average, which is depicted by the red line, and then 2023 epic. Um, the far right bar on each of the graphs, L storm, is for the largest storm. It's actually the largest single day, which may be a little less than a storm. But the point is, um, a lot of sediment can be transported in a single day. To give you a visual on what this actually looks like, here's a shot of my colleagues David and Kyle monitoring on Belmont Creek, one of the stations. Um, this is during an average event, just an average storm. You see um, the, uh, the road in the distance that's downstream, and what you don't see but off to the left is a gas station. So I'm going to show you a picture of the same, basically the same spot that the picture was taken, but during the New Year's Eve event. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, this gives you a sense of how a single storm, a single big day can transport as much sediment as many dry years or even average years combined. So going back to the, um, to the graphs, it was one slide, but I show it twice. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the y axes on each graph. So, um, Walnut Creek on the right, that is our biggest watershed in the study. It transported in 2020, 2023 almost 300,000 metric tons of sediment. It's a large contributor of sediment to the bay. So, keep that little nugget 300,000 metric tons in your brain. So we see similar uh, patterns of sediment load transport extremes in other watersheds around the bay. Whoops, excuse me. So this is Alameda Creek, um, the largest Bay Area tributary. These are, this is the rainfall on the upper graph and sediment loads on the lower graph um, for about a 22 year time span. Um, Rainfall extremes can be five times different, whereas uh, sediment load extremes can be about 400 times difference. Um, now, keeping in mind that the future will likely have more of the extremes, we can do a little thought experiment. We can ask, well, what if, what if um, we just had the wettest, the five wettest years and the five driest years? And what we see is that whereas, excuse me, I should look here, but it's really small. Um, whereas the average sediment load for the last 22 years was 150,000 metric tons, if you take just the five wettest and the five driest, it's 230,000 metric tons because a disproportionate amount of load is, is uh, being transported during the big events. Same thing we can do on Guadalupe River, which also has a long record um, it's the fourth largest Bay Area tributary, and when we look at the uh, annual sediment load for the last 20 years, it's about 14,000 metric tons, but you take the five, uh, the five wettest and the five driest years, and you get 20,000 metric tons. Okay, so I've been showing some observations from the last 20-ish years, but my colleagues in the sediment work group, uh, led by Scott, um, have estimated annual loads in nine focused tributaries uh, for the future uh, using a couple of global climate model predictions to help simulate loads for the mid 21st century and the late 21st century. 
they found that we are likely to see greater sediment loads later in the century, particularly in the North Bay, such as the Napa River. Also, just want to point out Walnut Creek again. So here, uh, by the end of the 21st century, it's going to produce on average, well, the models predict on average 300,000 metric tons. So that was, that was about almost what was transported this year. So what's a really big year now will become the average of the future. As an overall take home, oops, 300,000 metric tons. I have too many animations. All right, so as an overall take home from the presentation, yeah, over the rest of the century, we're likely to see slight overall warming. We're like, on average, we're likely to see on average a slight increase in annual precipitation. Um, and sediment will likely increase disproportionately in for the average annual loads. But while the changes for the averages might be meh, um, our future environmental conditions and fluctuations from year to year are not going to be average. And what's going to be really something for us to grapple with is how we is how we deal with the increase in both the extremes in the amplitudes and the frequencies of the extremes all right i want to point you to a number of great studies done by scott's team and you can access them all at the sfei website shown in the upper right everybody asked me about the weather coming up because i lead the stormwater monitoring team so i want to i want to give you the upcoming season predictions um, Basically, there's about a 95% chance that El Nino conditions will persist through March. 71% chance that will be a strong El Nino. Um, but what does that really mean for our area? Well, we get equal chances of above and below normal precipitation. <laughs> it gets worse. So Washington State climatologist Nick Bond says this about the upcoming year. The bottom line is that I think we should be guardedly optimistic that California will get at least a normal amount of precipitation, but we should not be too surprised if for whatever reason that doesn't work out. <laughs> All right, huge, huge gratitude to the stormwater monitoring team. They had a heavy lift this last year. They rose to the occasion. It's a true honor to work with everyone on the team. Uh, these folks oh, with the red dots, those guys are the part of the RMT team. So thank you all. Those are great presentations and uh, a testament to the talent that we have here at SFEI available as a resource to the, the community and the region and ask you to give them another round of applause. And then I'll ask the three panelists to come up for questions. Yes. Okay, so representing one of the lower South Bay POTWs. Is it really necessary? I totally appreciate all your analysis on dissolved oxygen, but we know that we're not actually seeing a bunch of dead fish down there. So is it really necessary to try and put a DO objective, one that we have to meet, that we know we're not gonna meet, where we're not actually seeing dead fish? I've been in the industry for 20 years. We're not seeing a bunch of dead fish down there. <laughs> uh, so we, um, I guess the, the point of the science is to understand what the not just what would be lethal for the fish that are currently living there, but also what are the ecological needs of the fish and um, whether or not you know, whether or not the conditions are supporting what the, the ecological needs of the fish are. Um, I don't. That's a question for the water board about how they choose to regulate that. I don't think that their plan is to require um i think it's to list the water body but not require um 
like not do a TMDL or something like that. So I think it's more like we're just trying to provide the science to in, like to inform any decision that the regulatory body wants to make. But it's um, the analysis is showing that the conditions are um, not supporting what the like e ecological needs of the fish in the system are. Yeah, maybe you can direct that to Tom on his way out. Um, but yeah, let's. Ian, I was just going to add something quickly to that. I this isn't a smart alecky comment at all. Until last year, that we didn't see any dead fish elsewhere in the bay either. And so the I think it's more of a, you know, there's the lower D DO that we're measuring, as you I think we've probably talked about before. The that low DO that we see is a balance between high oxygen waters coming in from the salt ponds where there's a lot of production, and then very high mineralization and respiration rates in the sloughs. And when Tom mentioned earlier that smoky day where all the, the cloud got the sky got dark. We saw oxygen levels nosedive during that event. So I think there's a there's certainly a lot of activity there that it, so I guess that's that's just another thing for to think about. There's the present and then there's the what's next. Uh, so I have the mic and I couldn't resist making a comment about the Sitting right next to um, you're sitting right, but for for sure. But there's all, like you know all of them are going to have different behaviors um, and different utilization. The we our, our program made a, this, a our, the steering committee made us a strategic decision about where to invest resources on HABs, and it was more on monitoring observations, etc., and not on going into mechanistic studies of the multiple potential taxa. Um, the yeah, so I, it, it certainly is possible, but then I think there's a kind of a, a question of which which ones to focus on, and which features. I have a question of the day, which is. Um, if, if one of the sparks might be the weak tide and the ability to migrate, how come we didn't get Akashiva sent in in the case? For those of you up there, it sounds like it's the same thing, but it's a kind of flagellate. But it's, it's, about, it's the only other one that's called the red tide, so the most recently in San Francisco Bay. And it's dinoflagellate, it has two flagellae. And it's very similar, but I give you a hint. I don't know, but as we were talking about different behaviors, it's much bigger. One thing about uh, um, Epicygnus is really small. And the other thing is it's a mixotrope. And I just wondered if, in all of your discussions, you talked about mixotrope as being something that you might be uh, using to get going. That's a good, that's a great question. The in terms of the specifics about the mixotrophy and the differences between the two taxa, I, I don't really have a great answer for that yet. But the I think the you know I I try I was trying to show that window of opportunity and I didn't I don't think I nailed the explanation of it. It's the idea that that window is partially open, but there need to be one or two other things that still line up, and it's conceivable that. One thing that could be could have contributed to the success of heterosigma that in 2022 was the fact that 
like a large point, a large mass source of it. You know, it was really brewing in the around Alameda and perhaps had much more of a chance to keep throwing seeds into the into the mix and, and eventually grow. And so the, that's one of those things that I don't know that we I don't know that we'll be able to nail down those really early stage stochastic, I guess, depending on the things. But I, I, one of the things that I uh, I think is is also relevant to consider is although it's early, we need to dig into this a bit more. But that same that same window of opportunity with spring and neeps and time of day, it, early analysis suggests that that was that phenomenon was occurring during the Akashiwa bloom or the yeah, Akashiwa bloomed in 2004 as well. There were other factors contributing there. So I think there's, um, it might be who's there, who's there and then their adaptive, their adaptive uh, prowess. And then just a follow-up to that is the, the other thing about, we forget about, the, the early years we don't know, but the early years, there's a seed population from that was in the bentos, coming in from the ocean or something. That's, the trigger was, getting the stuff up from the bottom. And I also wonder if Bill has, or Coughlin has, any ideas about how, what the switches are for cis germination of the heterosigma versus cis germination of the flagellates. Because I think if we look to some of the, uh, you know, Japanese and other data, I wonder. Again, good, good question. Worth, I look forward to talking to you about it more. Okay, I'll shift it over to and I'm just going to repeat your question. I, I think there's a hash on the Zoom. This is a question on the sediment loading, and you mentioned the higher sediments in the North Bay Creeks, and I couldn't help but think of these significant wildfires that happened the year and the, the two or three years prior to that, creating the sediment upstream to be released. Yeah, so I think the question was, was there a relationship between the fires and the big sediment loads that we observed? I think they're interfering. Yes, uh, well, the, I, am, I can only imagine that there is, are increased sediment loads after fires, right, and landslides, et cetera. Um, the graph I was actually showing, especially with the big Napa River, that was sort of a looking forward at the next, uh, the mid 21st century and the late 21st century. And this was work done by Scott, so Scott uh, and Scott's team. So Scott, if you want to pipe in at all, for sure. Um, but but yeah, and I think that the differences geographically are um, in terms of where we're going to see more sediment coming in. Yes, it has to do with geologic and geomorphic uh, characteristics of the areas around the bay, but it also has to do with where the greatest amounts of precipitation are expected to hit. So it's kind of a compounding factor and Napa River is just huge. So it, it does uh, bring in a lot of sediment total now and then as you're pointing out, you know, into the future. And I imagine with with fires uh, happening, it will it will be disproportionately large during those those following years. So it's a it's a good point. Thank you. This question is for David. Um, it, it was fascinating if you identified fairly clearly the reduced energy involved with the, the tide cycle. Um, and obliquely a little bit, I think, a, a higher temperature and with that, in all likelihood in the South Bay, less wind, mm -hmm. all of which generates both more heat for metabolic activities and less stirring of the bottom for any kind of sediment that would slow this down. Um, it, did I get that right is the question. And with greater temperature, is that going to be more common? I have to admit, I need to go back. I have to admit, I need to go back and take a closer look at the. Is that a closer look again at the temperature data? I know that we did go through all of these fairly carefully, and the the 
there was not, on the temperature side, there was not something that was, let's say, 85th, 90th percentile for, for August, let's say. And so the temperature was not, did not seem to be a, a big factor. The wind was wind and, and sediment mixing. Um, I, it, I think it's, a, it would be wrong to say that we, do, that we think sediment and high or low sediments weren't important for the evolution of the event. One of the things that was, I think, could really depend on space and time. Like one of the things that was really noteworthy was during a time period when the bloom was, wasn't was spreading into far South Bay, it, that was preceded by some, like some of the strongest winds on record at the Oakland Airport that resuspended a lot of sediments. And once those sediments cleared out of the water column, that coincided with the southward march of the, of the bloom. So there, there was, there was not low wind, and or but there, there wasn't evidence of low wind, but there was evidence of say pulses of wind that could have been influential, in, in some cases in the opposite direction. I don't know if I got your question well enough though. Okay. Thanks. Maybe we'll go up here first. Ah, uh, for Dave. This is about the um, two of the time series plots, Dave, on the nitrate concentration at the SHL station and then the chlorophyll, that the nitrate had been 30-ish micromolar and then dropped down to three-ish around the detection limit. And then the chlorophyll was fairly stable, I think 20, 25 or something. And then as the nitrate dropped, then that was when it sort of coincided with the increase in the chlorophyll. So that that was continuing on so that it was just a, a non-intuitive thing that the nitrate dropped and the chlorophyll was continuing to go up for several days and then it crashed. Um, your thoughts on why there was a lag or what was um, going on? What was sustaining the chlorophyll bloom if the measured data was showing that it was down at that lower level? Yeah, so I think one, one possibility is that although when we did the, the mapping surveys and we had the luxury of being able to collect samples for, for ammonia measurements, um, during those dates and those times, we, were, we could be reasonably confident about the level of ammonium and its contribution on top of the nitrate that was there. Um, we don't have that at high resolution at the fixed stations of the moorings. And so that's one potential contribution was some ammonium there that was you know, another 10%, 20% um, addition. I think another piece of it is when we've looked at that date, depending on how you look at the data or stare at it long enough, and maybe what you want to convince yourself is there, um, the, what, what I see when looking at that is that there's an increasing slope of um, net biomass increase, but then as the nitrogen levels decrease, that there, it appears as though there's maybe a, a, a decrease in the slope. So slower, still some growth, but not as, not as rapidly, let's say. So the, the, the one remaining possibility, and it's something that we're trying to constrain as best as possible, is that there, the extent to which once the nitrogen, the, like the, the standing stock of nitrogen is drawn down, how much do the ongoing point source loads, as well as the fluxes from the sediments, continue to sustain? Are they, are they able to grow and take nitrogen up quickly enough that it doesn't even really result in an elevated in concentration increase in the water column? So that's one other possibility. It's a little bit tricky to, to nail that down given the uh, yeah, resolution and, and other data limitations. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question on this. So this is for Dave as well. And uh, uh, one of the questions I, I do not, uh, I guess is when you showed the growth of the algal bloom over the period starting sometime in July or, or I forget. So it shows that it starts at the very edge of the uh, water and the land, right? And then it moves on. So I wanted to uh, know if they, so if the 
there isn't anything at that edge of the land, if that is pure, then would the bloom still grow? I mean, no, good, good question. One of the, that may tie back to one of the things that Francis was mentioning is that this organism for, forms cysts and, and hangs out in the sediments. And so the closer you are to land, the closer you are to shallow water. And maybe that's where there were some cysts that were able to form and higher abundances of cysts that were able to come out into the water. And then the water was at some uh, conditions that encouraged that. Yes, I, that, I think that would be a reasonable way of thinking about it. The One of the other... I guess something that I didn't mention, but I, Ian might be able to correct me on this too. Like there was, there was anecdotal evidence that the people that first spotted the the event around around Alameda Island said that they regularly see that every year, this streaky, dark-colored water, and that this happened to just be a, a very extreme event. And so the, but I don't think we know what would have led to it being more extreme this year than other years. Thanks. We had one more question from. Uh, Zoom, which was also something I had a question of. I think, Alicia, you kind of indicated that given the kind of nonlinear relationship between precipitation and sediment loads, um, do we think that we can basically meet our sediment demands in the future? If we think, you know, I, Scott could answer this also, but... Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to redirect that to, to Scott. He's... Um, how, how much are we talking? <laughs> Two million, right? I mean, the safe answer is maybe. Is it on? The safe answer is maybe, right? <laughs> and, and I think as we do more research, do more modeling, we'll, we'll shed some light on it. But there's still a lot of unknowns. And I, I guess I'd say that there's many of us in the audience here and probably who are you know, watching over Zoom that are just starting to do research that can help answer that question. Because the one thing I think is worth pointing out in the, the bar graph that Alicia showed showing Walnut Creek, so all of those loads um, and showed Napa that was the big winner. Like I, in general, that's what's gonna happen. Those watersheds that contribute a lot of sediment now will continue to do so in the future. But those numbers that she showed from the study that, that we had done a few years ago, those numbers are underestimates because they don't include the impacts of these large storms that Alicia pointed out. They are based on monthly average flows. So they are, they're, they're lower than what we think we'll see. So I just wanted to point that out, that the future will probably, when the big storms get bigger, we'll have, because of this nonlinear relationship, more sediment. But then back to the question, is that gonna meet our need? Maybe. With an answer very similar to that Washington meteorologist. Um, <laughs> but we'll have to leave it at there. Thanks for your time and uh, feel free to corner these guys during the lunch. Lunch will be served upstairs. It's not. It's just not very loud. <laughs>